So we're recording now. Um, so uh, I don't know if Brandy heard my question or not. Um, Katie, are you here? Can't hear Derek. I, I know why. Why is that? Can you hear Derek now? Did you mute me again, Zach? I never added desktop audio to the countdown. Brother. Like the show starting soon. I am so sorry. Brother. Uh, um, well. <laughs> so how's the audio, everybody? Um, I just got a visual cue that we're good. We're good? Yeah. Okay. So, I am going to switch to the pre-roll video that I actually did. <laughs> Yay. Pre-roll video with sound, right? With sound. We're getting somewhere in that sound. Everybody's happy. All right. Blah! We're face showing. Our faces are showing? Our faces are showing. People can see our faces. I see a black screen. Oh, there we are. It's like it shouldn't have been Ooh. a black screen for very long. Hi, nah, I, th I think we're good. Hi. Hi, everybody. All is well now. Except for the fact that there's two desktop audios. Ah, turn one down. Oh, did you have me twice too? Yeah, because remember we added a desktop audio, but there was already the default desktop audio. So instead of adding it again real fast in the countdown and pre-roll video uh, sources, I just turned the default one up. But it didn't okay. turn it back down when I switched scenes. Good. Uh, um, by the way, the overlay says gaming podcast, not tech podcast. Um, um, <laughs> I did the same um, thing. Don't freak out about it. It's um, fine. All right. What? <laughs> Growing pains. <laughs> We're sticking with gaming. <laughs> yeah, guys, uh, my computer's having a couple more issues this time. So uh, <laughs> Zach is hosting again. <laughs> so while Zach hosts... Um, Probably today. Hopefully, I'm going to try to reinstall Windows and um, do a whole thing. <laughs> you just let, let me guess what happened. Let, let me guess before I continue. He probably minimized Skype or something, and my face started twitching. Did that happen? <laughs> no, when I switched over to uh, two webcams tech scene, it just centered your video. It made it the same size, so your head was just split between both. <laughs> good good i'm glad we have a lot of production quality i'm really happy about that um we're sticking with gaming for today but it is the tech podcast oh no yeah um not gaming no gaming stuff today um, um I will, anyway uh, I'll later on that. this week uh later on this week maybe tomorrow possibly friday um I'll, I'll be working on my system and probably getting everything fixed with it may have to reinstall windows but that's okay because i keep frequent backups which all of you should too. Backups are good. Hey, I will oh. touch the buttons, Brandy. Leave me alone. <laughs> and I, I'm super happy about uh, Facebook not updating my comments again. Or that maybe, is she, maybe she was talking about your keys. Uh, the keyboard? Oh, should I uh, talk about that very quickly? Uh, yeah, actually, please do. All right, let me uh, pull the stream back up so I can actually see myself. Okay, cool. So, egotistical jerk. You heard it. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I want to try something new. Um, I previously made a video about regaining your online anonymity and um, actually keeping yourself safe online by using a VPN and Tor together so nobody can actually track what you're doing. Now, I want to make a new kind of video series. Yes, a series. Uh, where I test the cheapest crap on Amazon, starting with mechanical keyboards. Of course, it'll all be computer hardware, um, gaming-related things. But 
I Testing Amazon's super. cheapest ice cube tray. Yeah, maybe not that. <laughs> um, I was able to score a full mechanical keyboard for forty dollars. So let me turn the backlight on here. It's upside down, but I've already unboxed it. This is the thing. This is the whole thing. Um, it's buttons. actually, yeah, it oh. is very uh, glossy, right there. Um, but it uses blue mechanical switches. Let me give you an example of that. You're very you're, clicky. You are a terrible individual. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know, I know. At least I'm not using it to type today. Um, I could have put you all through that. I'm using one with red switches, so it's much more quiet. No, um, no. But I'm going to put this keyboard through the races and see exactly what it's made of. I already kind of like it, but I'll save more of my opinions for the actual review and testing portion. It claims to be water resistant, so that will definitely be put to the test. Um, after this, I'd like to try maybe speakers, uh, headphones, uh, anything I can really get my hands on for, you know, relatively cheap because that's the whole point testing the cheapest blah on Amazon. I can't spend too much money on it, so why not go for something other people might buy anyway? That's not me. Hands off. Those are brown switches coming from Zach. Don't tell everybody. <laughs> so yeah, between us, uh, technically we have the three most popular switch types now. I have red and blue, you have brown, so that's cool. Thought I'd reply to Nathan's comment real fast. Okay. Well, uh, with that information out into light, do you want to start on the news for this week? Uh, e one second. Uh, okay. You take your second. All right. Oh, well, Katie left a really long comment, and I'm a slow reader, so. A lot of it's because I didn't clean my glasses since work. <laughs> yeah, I have to say that, um, re replying to Katie's comment, I'll just read it aloud so that people on YouTube aren't super confused. Uh, she said, I will say, I fought Zach in getting a mechanical keyboard because of the noise, but he got one with brown switches and it isn't bad. Plus, the feel is nice. That's why I got red switches originally, because they're supposed to be the quietest. And I, I don't know, you tell me, guys. This is red. With dampeners. With Yeah, so technically it is a little quieter, quieter than normal. Um, so here it is. This is red. Do you want to do uh, brown very quickly? Uh, yeah, one moment. Let me get somewhere where it's safe to type. Okay. So this is brown, no dampeners, right? No dampeners. And this is blue. I'll go into more detail about that um, in the video. I'll just touch on it briefly. You know, the difference between red, brown, blue, black, green, clear. There are so many different switch types. And don't forget about the Logitech's Ro Romer, Roma. Yeah, there's Romer G, there's Cherry MX, there's Otemu, there's... Um, they're actually laser switches now. Um, so that the key press is actually detected by a laser. So it's technically the fastest kind of switch um but i simply don't have the budget to actually get my hands on all those at the same time uh, so i'll talk about them instead of show them like we do everything else in this show including our first topic of the day the red holographic smartphone yeah there's no way i'll be able to afford this in the near future um i totally planned to buy one with like sure you did I was going to. I was going to save back a couple of paychecks and then just dump them on a phone. <laughs> dump on a phone, okay. And then Katie told me I was stupid and I wasn't allowed. She may not be too far off with that. Probably not. <laughs> I'm kidding, man. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's an incredible amount of money for the phone. Um, let's talk about the actual specs first, though. Yep. And so, um, the main selling point of this phone. So it is titled the Hydrogen One. Mm -hmm. Uh it's a premium smartphone boasting holographic display. All right, so it does have a holographic display. Um, a 5.7-inch um, yeah. holographic display. Um, 
Red states users can view all traditional 2D content morally at full screen resolution. Holographic red hydrogen 4 view content, H4V. Stereo 3D content, 2D, 3D, VR, AR, and MR. So, like, that's a lot more than your traditional smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, um, but really quick, we haven't seen any kind of holographic display yet. Now, <clears throat> I totally... I trust Red, the company that's introducing this phone. Um, their their background is in extremely high end cinema cinematographic cameras. Um, so think movies, think film. Um, these are the cameras that are used for that kind of thing. So this company isn't really new or green to fifty really thousand dollars a camera. Yeah, a, a typical camera body, just the camera body. Because with red, everything's modular. You have to buy separate lenses. You have to buy basically an adapter card for to actually use SD cards. Um, just the camera body alone is fifty grand. So th this whole holographic display, I'm not one hundred percent sold on the concept of it until I see it. Um, because nothing like this has been done. So who knows what it really is? Um, the article here states. This incredible retina riveting display advancement features nanotechnology that seamlessly switches between 2D content, holographic mute view content, 3D content, and interactive games, both landscape and portrait mode supported. That, to me, just sounds like a whole bunch of buzzwords put together in a sentence. Like, what is holographic mute view content? I've never heard that string of words before together. I, I haven't either. But, you know, I think I know who has. Google. Who's that? Google. <laughs> Fair enough. Our good friend Google. Um, so, just another uh, comment from the site. Embedded in the operating system is a proprietary H3O algorithm that converts stereo sound into expansive multidimensional audio. Think 5.1 on your headphones. So... They're going beyond the screen in this for the holographic sense. They're, they're they're trying to broaden the audio system too on this phone, which that's real interesting. Like how how much boom can you fit into a phone? That's my question. Um, quite a bit. <laughs> really though? No. I mean, it can only be the driver can only be so thick for the speaker. So. Well, that's the thing is there's, you know, there's true, like, there's true bass and then there's simulated bass. So, kind of like uh, Apple headphones. They have, like, a really deep, rich bass, like the earbuds. Yeah, but and they have a relatively small driver in those. They have a very small driver. And what it is mm -hmm. is it's simulated bass. So, the way that works is is, like, you create a very tight-knit coil like exhaust so all right so in a traditional speaker system unless you're talking sealed units you know how there's uh portholes generally like in the actual speaker box so we, well, let's talk about a standard driver like a standard woofer if you took that that tube the exhaust tube and just like put a bunch of spins on it so it had to like so all the air had to like travel through a coil pipe then then evacuate it would yeah. actually have a much deeper base because <laughs> right. it, it resonates. Would just be a big echo chamber so that's that's essentially how Apple did it is they used a really tiny driver and then they forced the air to circulate a few times before it could leave and to, but it leaves directly into the eardrum so it creates a really deep bass sound right and they but you're might not getting done... that with the smartphone. It you depends can't. how small the driver is or how they want to do it. It's possible, not really plausible, but... <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't know words. Um, it's plausible. It's so possible. So something else I've seen... It's not... Something I else I've worry. seen in products was um, you know, vibrations to actually create kind of like a base resonance in your body. Um, so I know there is kind of like a smartwatch available Um Smart mod watch meaning it, it wraps around your wrist. I don't think it has any time telling capabilities at all. Uh, but the thing wraps around your wrist just like that, like a watch, and it actually vibrates based on 
you know, your music for coming from your phone through Bluetooth. So by using that in conjunction with earbuds, you can create the illusion that you're actually experiencing bass and uh, low frequency audio, but it, there's no sound. It's just resonance in your body. So, so maybe they're doing something like that with the back of the phone where you can feel the vibration in your hand. Possibly. But even then, you know, that what if it's on a table? Who knows right. until we actually uh, watch someone get their hands on this thing because um, at the price. You want to cover the price, sir? Uh, momentarily. I want to cover a comment by Katie. She says I, I, I should get Red Bull to sponsor me. <laughs> she also said that you can see my call stuff. So... Um, the Skype controls. You can actually see those in my video. Oh. What? Why, why are those going away? I don't know, sir. Um, let me click on your face. Okay. okay. Hmm. Nope, I cannot seem to get them to go away. Okay, we will deal with them. I am terribly sorry, everybody. It is all good. So, something else in this article says, Glasses are obsolete. Um, it is no longer necessary to carry or charge another device to enjoy multi-dimensional content. Experience look around depth in the palm of your hand. No glasses or handsets in sight. Uh, so th there was another product that was that kind of tried to do that. It was the the Amazon Fire Phone, which yeah. failed pretty miserably. Um, so s <clears throat> basically, what it did was, was it tracked your eyes, and when you moved your phone around, it actually created this kind of depth of field illusion based on where your eyes were looking on the device. So I wonder if that has a lot to do with this, a and they're actually able to manipulate. The location of objects on the screen based on your eyes. That makes perfect sense because we've seen it done before. It does make sense. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. I honestly, I'm. I just want. I'm. I'm going to wait for more information on the phone and probably do a follow up in another Wednesday stream because it's definitely got a lot of like action packed stuff in here. Like it, it's. <sighs> It, from the sounds of it, it's going to live up to like Red's standard. I hope it does because Red has a Red has a crazy standard to hold up to. So, but all right. So there's going to be two versions of the phone. There's going to be an aluminum version and a titanium version. The aluminum version will cost one thousand one hundred and ninety-five dollars, and the titanium will cost one thousand five hundred and ninety-nine dollars. Yeah. yeah. Money. So, so, like, just throwing this out there, like, it would take me almost an entire month of work and not paying any of my bills to buy the titanium one. Like, I'd still have money in my pocket afterwards, of course, like, but I'm just saying it would, it would take the better part of the month to afford that phone and it's not paying any of my other bills. That's ridiculous. Pretty much the same boat, man. That's ridiculous. That is, well, we're not the target market. I mean, we'll be real about it. Um, as much as we would like to have our hands on this, this is specifically kind of designed for people that are already in the red ecosystem. And to be in the red ecosystem, you're already spending tens of thousands of dollars. $50,000 on a camera, $20,000 <laughs> yeah. on accessories. Yeah, I, I believe um, Linus Tech Tips bought two, two of, of them. them. Two of them, yeah. And they were totaling close to $100,000 each with all the accessories. So that's with the grips, that's with the lenses, that's with the, the display, that's with um, the adapters with cameras. You have to have a separate I, module just for HDMI output. Yeah. I remember his video where he was complaining <laughs> because they bought the cameras and then they couldn't use them with any of their current stuff because they had to buy adapters for everything because yes. all of Red's crap is proprietary. <laughs> But it's not crap. It's the best on the market, at least in that kind of space. It's the best crap you can get. <laughs> it is the best crap you it's can a get. Polished, it's a polished turd. Yeah. <laughs> Please right. sponsor us, Red. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be awesome. Oh, uh, well, what happened um, now? <laughs> moving on, uh, talking about 
we're kind of talking about, about augmented reality, virtual reality here somewhat. Uh, so I'll go ahead and jump into a new chapter for Google Glass. Um, so some of you may remember back in 20, I think it was 2013, uh, Google announced the original uh, Google Glass, which was basically this little module that could sit on top of your prescription or otherwise uh, glasses. And it was a little computer. It had a small screen on it um, that provided augmented reality. You could see overlays, like a map, um, various other things. And it, it had a camera and it was a voice controlled. So you could say, okay, Google, and it would, crap, hang on. Why did I say those two words together? Crap, um, hang on. <laughs> no, the other two. Um, the OG. I'm... Okay, Google. Uh, I missed I you again. actually. I missed you saying that, and then I made you say it again. Or That's did correct. I hear it and I make you say it again because I'm a jerk? The world may never know. Uh, Xbox so... off. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, you're mean. Uh, so it looks like Google's back at it again. After about two and a half years without updates, um, they finally released an update for Google Glass. Uh, this new version is geared toward enterprise customers. And one company, DHL, you might be familiar with them for shipping, um, they actually ran a case study back in 2015 um, using augmented reality in the, uh, what did I call that? The supply chain. Um, so basically, there are employees in some warehouses, including the one um, where I work, called Pickers. And these people, uh, their entire job is to walk around aisles of products. And pick their pick, nose. Sometimes. Uh, and, and pick out the products that customers have ordered, place them in a cart, and take them over to a packing station. Um, so these individuals normally have a picking list, which is just a list of the item numbers that they have to get. Um, and, and, of course, they're sorted by order. Um, so if you place an order for, say, three products, the picker has to walk around the aisles, pick out those three products, and get them ready to be packed. Um, that can be a little bit tedious because finding the correct item may not always be easy, and you're always dealing with paper. And in a paperless world, we need to move on from that. So DHL actually implemented Google Glass and another product in their supply chain, and they were seeing about a 25% increase to productivity uh, for their pickers using augmented reality. So, wouldn't it be almost just as easy to use a tablet with an e-doc? Well, you you would think, but perhaps these people were very proficient workers uh, that used both hands all the time, and they were just power power workers, I guess. Um, so, using AR, you can see an overlay of the products as you're walking by them. So you can just grab them, throw them in your cart. Grab them, throw them in your cart, instead of having to refer to, say, a picking sheet or a tablet. Because, really, the hmm. tablet is not much different than the sheet, if you think about it. Yeah, you still yeah. have to re reference something. Yeah, but it, it doesn't have such a huge resource waste. True. It's not yeah. impacting the environment if you use an e-doc and a tablet or something. That's, that's where I was kind of thinking. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, sometimes if you go into a warehouse, you'll see individuals... Um, using like an iPod Touch or a small smartphone, yeah, uh, wrapped in a dock that has a scanner on it, and that scanner can scan the barcode and mark it off the list for the customer. That that's one level above just using a picker list. Um, but I think this this augmented reality is extremely interesting, and it could uh, definitely come to more businesses within the few years, the next few years. Um, Unfortunately, I, I see small yeah. inefficiencies with uh, the Google Glass implementation on on just that specific idea versus like smartphone with scanner and that's uh What's that? that's like multiple people wanting the same item for like picker list you you get you know a list of what this customer ordered and then you go grab their items package them and then you go back through how many times a day are you grabbing the same item you know for different people versus with the at least with the scanner list, you could be like, all right, I have to grab five of these, and as you scan them out of the system, it's attaching that barcode to the customer, and you can sort them all when you're done. Well, I think <clears throat> so. Where I work, it's not done like that, and I think to do something like that would require, you know, a, a change in the process that wouldn't be related to Google Glass. I think that would be more of a, an efficiency thing on just how things are operated. Um, well, uh, you, I know you can totally propose that. 
I, I could, um, but I don't think a, a buffer zone like that would actually be helpful in our situation. Because you, you would have to have a buffer zone to do that. If you get, like, say, five products and, say, you only have three people packing, um, then you still have to have a buffer for the other two items while you wait for the packers to get to those orders. That's true. All right. What the heck was that? That was a door. Okay. <laughs> yes. It sounded like somebody like knocked over a tin roof. <laughs> uh, no, I think that was um, that was my girlfriend walking outside and trying to be quiet. Attempting so hard. <laughs> <laughs> she, she tried so hard and, and got so far, but in the end, it didn't even matter. Copyright strike. <laughs> but um. All, All right. right. You got some news about SSDs, don't you? Actually, talking about augmented reality and you know, I'll stop oh AI. Stuff. Yeah, AI. let's go straight for it. So, this is a big one. It's a doozy. All right, it, it is kind of a big one, though. Um, yeah. AI usually is. So, uh, Elon Musk advocates AI regulation. So, essentially, here's some article stuff. Uh, I'm going to switch off of that now. Cause I I want to I want to look into the camera when I speak about this because I have my own opinions on this as well. Okay. Um, so Elon Musk. Uh, I'm sure most people that watch this stream know who Elon Musk is. He's only like one of the most amazing people on the planet right now. <laughs> Just with a lot of the adventure or not adventures ventures he's a part of or has started. Um. So, Elon Musk is actually an investor in Google's DeepMind and co-chairman on <laughs> OpenAI. Um, yes. He's also, as most of you probably know, the man behind Tesla, SpaceX, SolarCity. Um, so, just keep that in mind while we go over this, all right? So, Elon Musk has been accused of spreading fear or fear mongering um, because he did a, uh, an interview and spoke about his concerns against AI and stated that there needs to be regulations on AI research. Um, so while speaking at the national governors association summer meeting in Rhode Island, he was quoted as saying, and I quote, I keep sounding the alarm bell, but until people see robots going down the street killing people, they don't know how to react because it seems so ethereal. Eth... Eth... eth words. End quote. I give up. Oh, <laughs> freaking criminy. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm trying to find where you were in that quote. Uh, the last which... word, literally. Ethereal. Ethereal, yeah. That's yeah, what I was... they don't know how to react because it seems so ethereal. Yeah. So, stupid smart people and their big words. <laughs> <laughs> big words are fun, man. Uh, all right. So, oh gosh, another quote. <laughs> you want me to take it? Go for it. Uh, is it the AI is a rare? Yes. Okay. AI is a rare case where I think we need to be proactive in regulation instead of reactive. Because I think by the time we are reactive in regulation, it's too late. H how's that for fifth grade reading class? <laughs> there wasn't a stupid word in that one. <laughs> Damn you, Elon. <laughs> he speaks about the turbulence and regulations and lack of regulations being a fundamental risk. Um, and yeah. I'm not gonna quote i have a bunch of stuff here but you do uh, you have a, this is probably the largest set of notes i've seen from you yet <laughs> <clears throat> this um, is insane man. so this was actually a story that uh katie really wanted to touch on too she's she actually did a lot of reading up on this and then passed it to me um, yeah so essentially what what Elon Musk is stating is that we we don't have any laws, bylaws, regulations, or just set standards to what we're allowing AI to become. 
and I, I his his fear and what he's trying to warn people about is by the time people get up to speed and actually want something to be done about AI, we're going to be nearing like Skynet <laughs> status. <clears throat> yeah. Um, if I may have some input very quickly, I think he's really onto something here. Um, it, it is pretty dangerous. See, I, uh, I fully just, agree. And, and the thing is, people don't actually see it as dangerous. What he means by ethereal here, I, I think, is that when people think of AI uprisings or robot uprisings, you think of something like iRobot, uh, where you have physical manifestations of things, you know, rising up and, you know, Terminator kind of things. You have literally robots taking so... over the world in a physical realm. But the reality of this is and AI, AI is all it, software. Yeah, it's going to sit on somebody's desktop, fully connected to the internet, with access to whatever the hell's connected to the other end. Yes, and the more concerning thing to me is it's going to sit in a server rack somewhere, never to be seen by human eyes, ever. It'll just be triggered by a botnet one day. You know, again, a botnet is uh, basically just a mesh network of computers that are controlled um, through viruses and worms. That's how they're spread. Um, but if, if some rogue agent one day gets a hold of, you know, part of a government facility inside of a, a botnet and just keeps it there, right? No one ever finds the, the infection. And uh, an AI, a rogue AI, is able to take control of that botnet. It could potentially launch nuclear weapons. It could, it could... remember the, the Moab, the mother of all bombs that was launched against, I, I believe it was Afghanistan. Uh, no, it was it was Syria, wasn't it? I think it was Syria, yes. Syria. Apologies, guys. Uh, it, it's been a little while since that happened. But it, it was uh, targeting an ISIS headquarters. That isn't nuclear. But again, that was the largest non-nuclear weapon to be ever yeah. launched. And an That's AI could easily just take care of an entire civilization with that. All right. So if... The robots. If, no, if, if the people watching this do, do not know what a Moab is, just... Like, it's mother of all bombs, literally. <laughs> like, um, find, just Google it. Look at a picture of it. They, it is a massive warhead. Like, it, it puts me to shame, and that's saying something. Yeah. Nah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But no, so, there's, there is so much that could happen, though, with a rogue AI, and, like you said, launching bombs, but even if we go less world ending because of death, you could talk yeah, more I, I just wanted to throw that out there very quickly, Zach, because it's something people can relate to. Yeah. Well, no, there's something else people death can Death is relatable. Relate. There, there's something else people can relate to. Remember that all, like, developed countries' currencies are ran off of servers, not paper. There's that. Yeah. So, like, literally a rogue AI could get its hands on a botnet and essentially make every ounce of your currency worthless, unless you have it backed up in gold, silver, and platinum. Or traffic lights. Traffic lights. Um, soon, soon to be vehicles. You know, vehicles are going to be controlled via the internet. Uh, um, not necessarily the internet, but they're going to be controlled through a mesh network of computers. Um, you, sooner than many of us realize. Uh power grids are controlled yeah. via server farms all utilities like gas regulation water power um a lot of people in larger cities don't even have like centralized heating units anymore they're ran off of hot water so if water you know if your water station is sent offline you no longer have heat or fresh water That's these are huge right. and then as Katie stated, too, with AI as fast as it's been developing, and honestly, it's really cool, but at the same time, it's really scary because if you have a piece of software that can learn, it's not going to be hard to train it to take your job. No. It, it, you know, it, it's really funny you mentioned that. Um, this wasn't a piece of software learning to take a job, but... Uh, I, I remember probably two or three months after I started my first job in software development, um, we had a, a tire blow on our car. I just want to tell you how easy this is for people to lose their jobs. 
through software and automation. Um, so we had a tire blow in our car, and we went to the local Walmart to get a tire because it was the closest place. Um, and I remember a guy came out with a little tablet, and he said, okay, I need to get some information from you. And my response was, so is that all you're doing? Are you just getting our info? Yeah. Oh, is that like all you do all day? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> all, all, all right. Um, and in the back of my head, I thought, you know, in a week, extremely conservative estimate, I could write a program that replaces that guy. And I'm not even that great of a developer. So yes. you know, these AIs are written by some of the most brilliant minds in the world. And just, I can't even comprehend what some of them are capable of. Just having access to all of the world's information at literally light speed. Yeah, it's, it's really scary. And that's the thing, too, is there's so many organizations that are categorizing and uploading world history, just transcribing it from paper to online documents. And it won't be too long and <laughs> it won't be long in the world, like everything about world history that we have access to will be available for everybody on the internet, including AIs. It'll know everything about human history. It'll know what, like, and that's the thing too, is like, what about like government replacement? Cause Katie talked to me about this. She's like, honestly, I, she's like, I, I think about it two ways. She's like, wouldn't it be a lot easier to n not have a corrupt government that always does everything by the book if it was an AI? Yeah. And AI, AI would really just be, kind of a, a reasonable um, thing to replace a government with. But then that's I, like, we need like a, a jargon of philosophy podcast <laughs> now just for that. But, see, I had one example that like really popped in my head though, right? So like, let's say, you know, somebody got in a car accident, right? Um, let's say somebody like, they were pulling out of a parking lot and somebody cut them off. And they, they hit the rear end of the vehicle and cut them off. Technically, since they hit the rear side of the vehicle, U.S. law states that it was the driver that hit them's fault. Because... Uh, I'm sure that varies, but yeah, mostly. I know in the state of Ohio, if you hit anything beyond or behind uh, the first quarter of the front doors, it's considered your fault. Because uh, you had enough time to react and stop. Because the vehicle was that far in front of you. You should have been mm. able to see them coming. Um, so, so some bonehead cuts them off. They hit the rear side of the vehicle. It's considered their fault. And let's say they're going to have to pay for all the damages, even though, so, you know, the jag off totally cut them off, disobeyed traffic laws, and they're going to get away with it. And AI would be like, uh, yeah, pay up. Versus, you know, a cop taking statements from witnesses nearby could be like, no, that dude totally cut him off. It wasn't, their, you know, it wasn't his fault. And they would, you know, and that would have actually, you know, saved them the trouble of all the legal fees and, you know, vehicle repairs. and. Yeah, I, I could see that definitely being an issue. You have to take ethics into consideration. Um, and, and those things are really best solved with, with a case-by-case -case basis, kind of like what we have it now. Uh, but to get past the corruption uh, at higher levels of government and just general, oh, what, what's the term for it? When, when things get kind of stuck. Um, I, I know that happens very frequently here in the U.S. Um, when we have like a, a Republican-controlled House and Senate versus a Democratic-controlled House and Senate, when bills just can't get through because they're being held up by the opposing party. Um, yeah. What's that called? There, there's a term for that. I don't remember. Um, well, anyway. I, I podcast be... news. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I'm, I'm a computer guy, not a political guy. Um, well, anyway that could be prevented in theory using an AI, but I mean, I, I'm sure the European union would be the, one of the first to actually um, introduce this. If it were a thing, I can think of a lot of instances where an AI would be good. And there's a lot of other instances where AI is bad. Um, yeah. yeah. Just like everything else. That's a huge thing too, is though, is you can't hand a, you know, crap load of money to an AI and be like, make sure I get the chair. Yeah, exactly. But, um, yeah, House from Fallout New Vegas. That's, I 
very spot on. <laughs> oh, that's really taken aback, yeah. Like, that that's a super spot on statement, though. <laughs> it totally is. Well, uh, moving on, I'm going to go ahead and uh, cover something somewhat related to um, government and governance and data. Where are you going? That's my that's my segue. Uh, Border Patrol says it's been barred from searching cloud data on phones. About time. Yeah, yeah, we do need to move a little bit more quickly through today's episode, but it is Never. all good. Good conversation is good. That's that's the end of it. Um, so. According to this article from NBC News, uh, it has come to light that the U.S. Border Patrol, <clears throat> excuse me, on both sides, the northern border and the southern border of the U.S., are limited from searching cloud data on phones. What that means is if you're paranoid, put it in the cloud. So put it, which is it's weird to hear, right? Um, put it in OneDrive, put it in Google Photos, and the Border Patrol is not able to search it. They are able to request your PIN code or your lock code for your phone and go through any local data like contacts, photos, anything on your device. Um, but if it is not located on the device directly, so if it's located on a remote server, <clears throat> they are not allowed to do that without uh, receiving a, a, a warrant. I'm right before I cross the border. I'm I'm just gonna Google like horse butt, and I'm gonna download like every image that shows up on the screen initially, and just make them swipe through a whole bunch of horse ass. <laughs> go for it, go for hey. it. Take a trip out to Canada and get pulled over. <laughs> there you go. You're not that far away, right? No, I'm really not. A few hours. A. Go for it. I, I heard your drink go like, what? <laughs> yeah. Not sponsored. <laughs> Not sponsored. I, I was like looking all over my monitors trying to figure out what, what, what was making the noise. Yeah, that was me. Man, I, I just got to say before we continue, the best way to get Coke. A cola. Coca-Cola. Snag that from an alley behind Kroger's, did you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, just glass bottles all day, guys. All day. So, Coke or Red Bull, I guess that, those are who we're looking to sponsor us, huh? Yeah, like that's ever going to happen. Really? One day, guys, one day. We'd have to start jogging while we did this to get Red Bull, at least. Like, do something active. <laughs> Couldn't handle it. No, uh, I, I can't podcast jog. Oh, jog casting. Jog That's got to be a thing already, right? I'm actually, uh, that was uh, one of my upcoming videos is going to be about uh, a 1080p, 40, a $40 1080p GoPro knockoff from Amazon. So Go for it. <laughs> um, maybe I might try out <laughs> jog casting. <laughs> Yeah, try it out. That'll be a good test for that forty dollar ten eighty p camera. Uh, I saw a four K one for like fifty dollars too. I'm gonna have to send that to you later, Zach. Uh, the four K one was only at like that I saw was only twenty five fps, and I was like, that's, "Oh, really?" Yeah, I was like, "That's such a weird frame that's rate." That's not good. No. I was like, it's it, had, for me. "It has to be at least thirty if I'm gonna if I'm gonna get it." Absolutely. Uh, well, that's really all I had for that story. It, it's as simple as that. The NBC article goes into insane detail, um, you know, with small interviews like large news organizations do. Uh, but the gist of that is basically if you're going out of the country and you don't want people looking through your stuff, put it on some kind of cloud platform. So I just have to address some comments. You don't know how much I actually have to run. Not jog, run while I'm um, at work. <laughs> would you mind reading off the comment for the YouTube viewers? My wife said, you don't jog. <laughs> and okay. then Nathan said, 10 seconds in, he'd be dying. A, I quit smoking a long time ago. I can breathe. <laughs> B. Breathe in. Breathe out. B, I've... I have to run a lot while I'm at work. Different situations, lots of heavy equipment. Running becomes quite frequent. Or, you know, somebody will be like, 
you know, they'll they'll take a man lift up to the roof and be like, I forgot to grab my batteries. You know, it's like, where they're at? The it's like, where are they at? And they're like, over there in that building, you know, which is 200 freaking yards away. And they're like, I need them now. Run. Oh, you dirty. That's a long son. distance. It's a big barn we're building. <laughs> it's two football fields. Um, that's actually this. That's actually like one of the small ones. Um, we're building the uh, stables now with gable, like the gable from gable end to gable end, is seven hundred and eighty feet. Like that's and that's like the small portion of this <laughs> barn. Yeah, that's it, about that's about uh, two acres, I guess. It's huge. A little freaking, over two acres. It's it's freaking huge, but uh, we we don't need to cover my my my, my job. So, um, <laughs> all right, next article. I guess I'll talk about this giant freaking SSD. Yeah, fifty terabytes. Fifty freaking terabytes. It is a three and a half inch SSD, which is fine. I mean, most uh, people are used to three and a half inch uh, standard mechanical hard drive. So uh, I can't imagine this would be that much of a big deal, especially in a desktop computer or a server. Uh, you're going to be fine. So yeah, there's already bays allocated for that, that size of, of a drive anyway. Yeah. So, they, they've been out there for years and years and years. It's not a huge deal, but all right. I scrolled through the, the stuff from our diggers. Um, so Viking is producing a 50 terabyte and 25 terabyte three and a half inch ssd um under their ultra high capacity silo series i would hope so that, um, that is pretty high capacity they're outfitted with a six giga oh geez bit yeah per second sas 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 interface uh they yeah. use planar multi-level cell mlc nand flash memory chips and an undisclosed next generation flash processor so it's probably something that's like uh marginally better than the previous generation whenever they don't disclose information on it so uh, they're using planar multi-cell technology that's mlc nand flash um, MLC is like 3D flash, so basically that just means they can um, clump a whole bunch of uh, memory chips on top of each other. Yep. Like that. And uh, which is much more efficient, of course. If they're handling heat well, because that's really my only issue with something like that, um, those chips will get hot. Very, very, very hot. That might be one of the reasons um, they went with 3.5 instead of 2.5, so they could space those clusters out a little bit more get a little bit more surface area to dissipate yeah and that could that could very well be it um so th cooling really is the only issue inside of that thing and i'm sure most of it is uh heat sink so, <laughs> i'm sure a lot of that is heat sink with a sas interface and a 50 terabyte three and a half inch drive you're really talking about server use of course, um, yeah. I don't really see desktop style servers very very often anymore. They're all rack mount with like they are. wicked loud, wicked high RPM fans, you know, clear across all the drive bays. That's generally how a lot of rack mount storage, you know, they're going to be cooled. There's going to be a lot of airflow over them. Um, so that's that would be my only assumption as to why they went with such a large thing was to kind of space them out a little bit more, get a little bit better heat dissipation, so it could be picked up by the airflow off of those high high airflow fans. A lot. Well, easier. you all you also need a lot of, of footprint to put that many NAND chips in there, because even though they're still using MLC NAND flash, um, they still have to spread it out, you know, on this dimension too. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure they needed the extra space, to, and they just kicked it up to three and a half inch because it was the next common form factor. So, but that's really cool. Um, 500 MB sequ sequential read and 350 write. Um, that's typical for an SSD. Yeah, that's like your standard SAS SATA connection SSD sort of stuff. It's been that way for a long time. Um, 
Uh, also rated with some random read write speeds. Uh, <laughs> up to 60,000 IOPS read and 10,000 IOP write. So really quick, IOP is um, basically interactions per second. So uh, an input or an output per second. Um, so whether that be like a single write or a single read from the disk, um, it can handle that many instructions per second. So uh, what was it? Read and write speeds up to 60,000. 60,000 read, 10,000 write. Right. So, so it's about six times faster at read, which is, again, pretty typical. Yeah. you're um, you're. I don't think I've ever seen an SSD that had the same read and write speeds. Reads always yeah. faster. And you probably won't for a long time because they have to change. They actually have to change the um, the ionization of the cells inside the memory when they write. Um, when they're reading, they're just picking up the ionization, so oh. it's uh, much more quick. It's much the, faster. It's the same way with a mechanical drive too. It'll always read yeah. faster than it writes. So, um, Viking claims clients can see a cost savings in power. Obviously, it's SSD versus mechanical drives. Um, Space and cooling of up to 80% per terabyte. So that that honestly makes a lot of sense, though. If you're talking 50 terabytes worth of mechanical storage, that's, first of all, that's a lot of heat because that's a lot of motors. Um, that's, that's also, you know, a lot of motors spinning up and moving a mechanical arm back and forth across disks, like, that it doesn't seem like it consumes a lot of power when you put it up to next, you know, up next to your CPU or your GPU. You're like, oh, a mechanical drive it consumes <laughs> 20 watts. That's nothing. Well, it, that's a lot for a laptop because um, you know, the screen is generally the, the the first thing. If you're on a low power laptop uh, and you're trying to conserve battery life, first you look at the screen, turn the screen brightness down, and then you try not to use your hard drive because the hard drive uses. A considerable amount of, of power 20 watts of consumption on something like any time you spin up a mechanical drive that that's it's a lot that, it's a lot and that's the thing too is like when you're talking a two let's, let's just take my 1080 for instance here it's like 230 250 uh watt consumption um like that's it's not a whole lot and consideration to the fact that my old fx cpu was <laughs> the same um but i don't like the gpu when it's just like idling at desktop or a youtube video or something it's it's literally doing like nothing yeah um especially right. especially for the power the power that the 1080 offers that that's really like nothing at all um but whenever you know my hard drive spins up I, if I'm, let's just say I'm downloading stuff off the internet and it's writing to my hard drive, I'm easily consuming much more power than my GPU is at that point. Much more. So, a lot of people don't take that into consideration. Um, it's, that's one of the reasons why I went basically strictly SSD and my mechanicals are in uh, an external enclosure was because i didn't want them to be constantly accessed i kind of wanted to like put them somewhere where i had them but they were definitely like not being used essentially gotcha well that makes a lot of sense um we, it doesn't look like we have pricing um for this particular ssd but if a one terabyte ssd according to this article costs about 300 dollars and you multiply it by 50 that's 15 grand it doesn't scale quite like that uh, but PC Gamer, decent job. I see what you did. So, honestly, for a drive like this, taking into consideration the engineering costs, I, I could probably see like a $10,000 price tag on the 50 terabyte drives. Like, because it's not gonna, like, you're not gonna have to scale, at, you know, you don't wanna scale directly. Because that's not how it works. It's no, it's, it's not it, linear. It's almost the same price for a one terabyte hard drive as it is for a five hundred gig hard drive, and it's right. It's just, just be, a little bit more. It, like if you're talking mechanical drives, it's the amount of platters that got put in. If you're talking 
SSDs, it's the amount of chips that got put on. So yeah, they're they're comparing SSDs to SSDs here. Yeah. Just uh, want to throw that out there. So, but interesting stuff. Uh, what what's next? Uh, I can cover the Piriform acquisition. Yeah, I think I will do that. So I, I misread your your title earlier, and I was trying to figure out what was going on. I I read acquires as requires. Oh oh! <laughs> I thought it was a whole different story. <laughs> Well, here's the story. Uh, Piriform is a company that makes software. Uh, normally, uh, like utility I software and optimization tools for Windows, Mac, Android. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with CCleaner. So CCleaner is Piriform's most popular product, but they make a few more like Recova. Um, yeah, it's it's pronounced just as gangster as I said it. Uh, Recova. So... I, I use Recover all the time, and I've used CCleaner for years and years and years. Great piece of kit. Um, well, Piriform has officially been acquired by Avast, maker of antivirus that I've had a love-hate relationship with for the last five years. Um, of course, Avast also acquired AVG um, recently, so they're really kicking themselves up a notch. I didn't realize they had acquired AVG. They had. Yeah, uh, so there's the hats. <laughs> No wonder it went to uh, crap. Well, you may be onto something there. They actually purchased a AVG for one point three billion dollars. Uh, so Piriform's employees will join a vast consumer uh, business unit, and as far as we know, C Cleaner itself will remain the same. Uh, of course, they say that, and we could see a lot more changes in the future. Uh, terms and conditions of the acquisition, like how much they paid for it. You know, whether there were stock options offered, that wasn't announced to the public. Uh, but if you see a big change in CCleaner soon, you know why. I really hope they don't do a change to CCleaner. I really like CCleaner. It mm -hmm. it gets in, it does what it was supposed to do, and it gets out. No no BS. Like, even Malwarebytes has started throwing a lot of in-your-face bull crap. Uh, like, well, to to be fair, um, C Cleaner does upsell every now and then, but not nearly as much as uh, Malwarebytes does now. Well, you know that's kind of like uh, WinRAR, amazing program. I love WinRAR, and it's like, hey, buddy, your uh, your trial expired, and you're like, I don't care, and it says, okay, go ahead and use me this time. I'll just remind you. <laughs> I'll remind you next time you open me. Good good luck with whatever your RAR file was, bud. <laughs> See? Yeah, I don't use WinRAR. I use 7-Zip. I use 7-Zip, too, because it, yeah. like, it, it integrates right into the right click, and I like it. It does, and you can get it through Ninite, which I might have to do a video on Ninite sometime. Actually, Everybody that would, should be that, using Ninite. That's a fantastic idea. Yeah, I'm going to write that down. Ninite. I think we found our next YouTube video. My next YouTube video is the keyboard. Oh, yeah, the keyboard. Ninite. So, like I said, I have, I have videos that I'm gonna make, guys. But sure, he does. They're they're all they're all out there. I like, kid. I'm gonna I'm, I want to I'm gonna show everybody how to drain and clean an open loop system. And but my loop still has like another three months minimum before the liquid needs changed. So that that one's a little out there still. Yeah, and that's kind of a hassle, which is why he, he feels a video needs to be made for it. Uh, so you need to drag that out as long as you can before it starts getting dangerous. So the liquid I bought actually states on the bottle, if mixed correctly, is good for up to a year and a half. <laughs> um, oh, wow. Yeah. So I, I, honestly, I honestly figured like the one year mark is probably when I would switch it out. But I'm actually noticing some evaporation issues so either a seal's not 100 percent tight or something so, something's wrong somewhere in here so i'm probably going to actually have to rip this apart sooner and find my issue i know it's not a leak okay but you could do a video about the troubleshooting there there's going to be a lot of bleeping <laughs> that's fine we, we have editing software we can do this 
Uh, I don't pay six hundred dollars a year for Adobe for nothing. Uh, yeah, Good Adobe. Come on, Adobe. <laughs> uh, Panda antivirus. I, I remember that. That that's cloud. That was cloud-based uh, antivirus software, wasn't it? Yeah, we used uh, Panda back when we opened our business. Yeah, like years and years and years ago. That it was, was fantastic. For, at the time, yeah, it was great. And then we uh, found that it, one it that the used. Processing. Go ahead. I was gonna say then we had that one antivirus that actually like downloaded every other antivirus's definitions and then scanned as if it was those antiviruses. Super anti spyware. I think. I no, think. it was Herd Protect. Yeah, that That's one. That's it. That one was Herd Protect, freaking sweet. Uh, they were acquired by somebody, and now they no longer offer a download. I'm gonna check on that because I need to check on them anyway. Like, that was really sweet, but probably, there was probably some, like, trademarks and copyrights and some laws and stuff that were not being... Yeah, perhaps not, because on their website, it says, we are currently not distributing Herd Protect at this time. If you would like to be placed on the waiting list, please email us at email. We are looking to re-release the software in the coming weeks. Um, Just as a disclaimer, I contacted them at that email address maybe six months ago. So... I wouldn't count on that. Probably some legal stuff in the background. <laughs> yeah, coming weeks is not six months ago. No. Coming weeks is like three weeks out max. <laughs> Correct. Well, uh, moving on, since this <laughs> podcast is taking about three weeks to finish. Uh, oh, you have, you have shoot. One story, right? Uh, yeah, one, one story. And uh, I, let me switch over to... Uh, you already covered border control. Uh, I think it's the the cryptocurrency. Uh, just covered that. All right, last thing here. What? Oh, <laughs> I did it again. I keep clicking the the actual two webcam tech one instead of my full screen capture, so I keep getting blips of your face cut in half. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. <laughs> this video is great. I need to host more often. Come on, this is fun. <laughs> Cryptocurrency sale hacker steals Ether worth seven million USD. I believe it's USD. Seven million dollars. You There's a dollar do. sign, so I hope it's USD. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That's why I said USD. Um, so that's the article. Um, so, all right, cryptocurrency platform CoinDash. Uh, they launched an initial coin offering. July 16th. Um, An initial coin offering is an unregulated cryptocurrency sale to kind of like fund startup costs for that cryptocurrency. Okay. So like the initial sales have a a goal that they want to reach. And once it reaches that goal, it kind of establishes the worth of the currency. And then as people start earning the currency, it'll you know, the currency goes down and it's worth because of the abundance versus the amount invested. And then when people start spending the currency, money actually transfers in. That's how it spikes. That's why Bitcoin's worth so much now is because it's being used even in physical stores. Um, it's one of yeah. the reasons it's worth more than gold. <laughs> it's become very popular. Uh, so, um, so, all right. I just kind of explained all that. Uh, Investors potentially aid in increasing the value of their crypto wallet. So as you invest into the coin, as you're buying the coin, you're investing a, like into the coin as you do it. So all the money you use to buy it's actually increasing the worth of the coin. And if enough people buy it in the initial startup, you could potentially end up with more money than you put in. If the, if the coin becomes worth more than your investment value. So like... Not a bad gig if it succeeds. Unfortunately, right. this story is being brought up because it didn't succeed. Because some jerkwad... <laughs> oh, some jerkwad. There's always one. <laughs> um, so, uh, let's see here. I lost my place in my notes. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, uh, startups huh? generally leave... Uh, vulnerabilities for theft and that's really what happened here coindash raised 6.4 in ether investments 6.4 uh 
I don't remember if that was supposed to be millions or just dollars. All right, I think it was millions. By the way, a hacker changed the Ethereum wallet address. So rather than when people with people paying in Ethereum for Ether, um, like essentially he redirected people's cryptocurrency money and bank transfers to his own personal instead of the f startup fund. And, and that's a that's a risk. Yeah, it's really a risk investing in a cryptocurrency like this. It's like someone starting a Kickstarter campaign for, hey, I want to make a new product. And then people donate a million dollars and then, oh, no, I couldn't get the product made. Oh, no, I'll take my money. Oh, no, I kind of left the country and you have no laws over me. <laughs> oh, oh, no, I have a Ferrari now. Whatever will I do? Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, essentially, uh, Coindash shut down the website as soon as they realized that, you know, this guy had already stolen seven million dollars. Um, Good they, idea. They shut yeah. down the website. Um, investors that sent funds to the fraudulent address will receive tokens, so essentially pay back for what they lost. Um, but anybody who sent transactions after they shut down the website don't get their money back. Are they SOL? They're SOL. Painful. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it's very, very difficult to track cryptocurrency. Mainly because mining is so huge that breaking breaking people's access to cryptocurrency is like huge to try to stop miners. Huge. And uh, so it's very difficult to track cryptocurrency transfers. Meaning mm -hmm. that the guy that just stole seven million dollars is probably going to walk. Yep, walk a rich man. Yeah. Like that, his, that's, his, that's the risk of cryptocurrencies, man. Everything is so shady on purpose. You know, it's designed to be that way. So if somebody's able to take advantage of it, I really can't fault them. Sure, are they being a really terrible human being? Absolutely. But just saying, I, I don't know. I like, wish I could give the guy a pat on the back. Just saying, like everybody's thought about. You know, that everybody's been to that one moment where they're like, I could probably get away with robbing a bank. Yeah. And, but then you remember that, like, everybody that robs banks gets busted. <laughs> and you're like, you know what? I probably shouldn't rob a bank. <laughs> right. Just, just saying, the reason why they get busted is because they never lay low long enough. They always, like, reemerge two weeks after they've done it. And they're like, I got yeah, this. Turned to the scene of a crime. Yeah. That kind of thing. They're, like, they walk into the same bank they robbed. And they're like, I want to open a savings account. Like, I got $15 million. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a coincidence. We just had fifteen million dollars come up missing yeah. a week ago. <laughs> hmm. hmm. Wonder if there's a connection here. Let's review the security footage, shall we? It's one of those things where, like, if you rob a bank, like, you should just like continue doing what you do, like hold your job, do it for a couple of years, and then like slowly start like introducing all of your stolen money back into your own stuff. Very quickly, disclaimer: we do not not advocate. <laughs> Any kind Don't. of illegal activity. <laughs> do not do rob not a bank. advocate that you rob a bank. We do not advocate that you lay low afterward. Don't I'm, be dumb. I'm just saying, if 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 you are going to be a criminal, like this guy, he robbed seven million dollars. But if he starts walk, if he was, you know, you know, sort of like in our situations, he works every day. He's got money, but he doesn't have like a bunch of money. Obviously, you know. Yeah. Like, his best bet's not to, like, stick a million of it in his pocket and go to a, uh, the car dealership. <laughs> you know? Probably his, not. His best bet's probably to, like, lay on that money for a couple more years and then, like, slowly start introducing it into his own, you know, pocket. You know, just start padding his own paychecks, per se. I'm, I'm sure that's uh, why people use money laundering schemes. But before we get any more into the dynamics of criminal activity, um, I want to thank everybody that's here today uh, for watching our podcast and dealing with this kind of ridiculous banter that we come up with for some reason. Um, Remember, don't and, rob and, banks. Don't rob yeah, banks. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> uh, and also thank you for stopping by Saturdays for our gaming podcast as well. And um, I'd like to take a moment and make a shameless plug for our website, jargonpodcast.com, where you can read write-ups of all of the topics 
we talk about on the podcast. And um, actually, that was my spiel. Speaking speaking quickly about the website, um, my wife actually wrote her first article, and I do believe it is a draft. It may be a draft on the website still, or she may have published it. I don't remember. I did see the draft. I hope um, we reviewed so, it first. I, I, I reviewed it. Um, I gave her the okay, but I don't remember if she saved it as a draft or not for you. I don't okay. remember. I don't remember what happened. I did review it and gave it the okay myself, though. Um, but it's her first one, and I think she did a phenomenal job. And if people went and read it, that would be awesome. Just saying. Okay, it is not up yet. Uh, let us let us run through it, and uh, it will definitely be up with the rest of the articles tomorrow. So. Um, and then, uh, last note before we leave: uh, don't rub banks. <laughs> don't rub banks. <laughs> don't rub banks. Don't listen All to right, me. Guys. I'm an idiot. I'll get you busted. Um, also, sorry about the gaming podcast overlay on the tech overlay problems. Here, let me switch to the tech overlay for the end of this. All right, Derek split in half. Here we go. All right. <laughs> okay, I, I can close like that. That's fine. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs> Uh, thank you again for watching. If you just caught the last bit of this episode, remember you can watch it on Facebook. It'll always be here. It'll also be on YouTube starting tomorrow. Uh, remember to tune in Saturday for the gaming podcast. Have a great week.